well, hello, I'm James. I'm a PhD student at the University of Bristol. I'm currently working for Embercosm. Uh, you may remember that we came and presented this project before it began last year. So we've been looking at how compiler optimizations affect the energy usage of your application. Um, so this really came out of a number of eco workshops, NG aware computing workshops which have been going on at the University of Bristol and this was identified as one of the the key points that we need to know about. How do the optimizations affect the energy usage of our programs? So definitely performance. We've got loads of optimizations which optimize all of our code for performance. We've got some idea about energy but um, mostly we don't really know which optimizations have a good effect on energy, which ones are bad, apart from the fact a general kind of feeling of if you go fast enough then your energy is going to reduce along with your, along with your execution time. So this study kind of came from a desire to have a number of different benchmarks, a number of different optimizations across a different across many different platforms so we could draw some conclusions about are there particular optimizations which are good for some benchmarks, particular optimizations which are good for some platforms and then we could hopefully find out is there one good optimization for this type of benchmark, is there one good optimization for this platform. So we've done an extensive number of optimizations and we've looked at lots of different platforms and benchmarks. So I'm going to talk to you about the benchmarks that we've chosen. I'm going to talk to you about how you can actually systematically explore every possible combination of options to a degree of uh, a certain depth. And then I'm going to talk about the perceived correlation between time and energy. There are some cases when it's not actually that correlated. Um, and talk about how you can or cannot predict the effect of some of these optimizations. And then I'm going to talk about how there are some good optimizations across some platforms, some good optimizations for certain types of benchmarks. On to the benchmarks. They're important because the effect of optimization depends on the structure of your code. So that's the main point really. So we divided our benchmarks and evaluated them for these four different categories. And these categories are kind of useful because each of them will have a slightly different energy c covered by it. For example, the memory intensive benchmarks they could have a different energy characteristic and a different energy profile to stuff which does a lot of br branching. And then if you take these and have a set of benchmarks which covers all of these points adequately, you should be able to get a view of the energy profile for each optimization. So we looked at a lot of different benchmark suites and came to the conclusion that we needed some more because these all require embedded Linux. Um, some of them will run on bare metal, but when typically if you run them on Linux, that's going to make it a lot more difficult to take your energy measurement. You're going to have the scheduler interrupting. You're going to have it's going to be very difficult to draw any firm conclusions about what is actually going on. So in the end, we took benchmarks from two of these suites, we took some from my bench and the WCET collection of benchmarks and came up with a list which looks a bit like this. So in the middle here we've got branching memory, integer and floating point and we simulated these on several different architectures to get these high, medium and low categories. So for example Blowfish does a lot of integer computation but little branching and a medium amount of um, memory accesses compared to the other benchmarks. Um, and then this set of benchmarks covers a good combination of branching memory, integer and floating point. So we should be able to expose all of the different effects that are going to be due to different types of instruction going through our pipeline, different memory accesses. So that's the benchmarks. Another important thing to consider is the platforms that we're going to be running our, our tests on. So the platforms we actually chose um, are embedded stuff. So we took small platforms, 
small amounts of memory, simple pipelines mostly. Um, for example, the M0 we chose only has 32 kilobytes of memory. The standout one here is the A8, which is a bit different because it's got a complex pipeline. It's got more cache than the M0. It's got memory. And then there's a couple of other more interesting processors, such as Epiphany, which has got 16 cores, and XMOS, which has got eight hardware threads. So using these, these have got a good range of different pipeline lengths, different memory sizes, um, different instruction sets even. So we should be able to make some good conclusions about which optimizations work well on which types of processor. And now, how to explore lots of different passes. Um, exploring all of these different passes each combination is a bit infeasible, as 2 to the 38 is a huge number of passes. Um, so we've managed to find a way uh, which has been used extensively in other industries. So it's used quite a lot in the industrial control applications um, to tune their processes, so fractional factorial designs. And this allows you to explore the optimization space to a given depth so you say, I've got, I want to do 2,000 tests. You put it into this methodology, and it will say, you run these combinations of tests, and we can be sure to this level of certainty that these factors are what we think they are. I'll give you a quick overview of how this works. So for three factors, you've got eight different tests. We've got x1, 2, and 3. So these are each representing a different optimization, which can be on or off. Um, you can imagine as we add more optimizations to this, it becomes exponentially large and infeasible to test them all. We can estimate how much of an effect X1 has on average by doing something like this. We will take the average of all of the, all of the tests which have the optimizations on, so we'll sum up all of the energies and t take the average for when they're on, take, subtract that from the average of when the optimization is off. And this will give you a rough effect for this factor. Then you can do this for each optimization, and that will give you an ordering of, we think this one is the most effective optimization, and this one is the least effective optimization. The also, the interesting thing is you can do this for pairs of optimizations too. So you can say, we think when you combine these two optimizations together, they're particularly effective, and when you or when you combine these two together they have a net negative effect. And it's, it's good to note that these are all done over thousands of tests so they are statistically significant. So that's for a full fractional, fractional factorial design. To reduce this we apply some methodology to get a fractional factorial design which involves removing a systematic set of points from this optimization space so here shown here is a, a half fraction, so it's called, which will only test half of them and will allow you to resolve it to a lesser degree, but still enough to discern the main factors. So this loss of information is quite important. Um, as you increase your resolution, you keep more information about the f factors. So for example at a resolution 5 you get the main factor, the optimization on its own will be alias to a interaction between four other optimizations which is generally quite rare. So we've picked this as a good, a good level of resolution and that is to be noted that's for 37, 37 different factors which for GCC 4.7 were the number of command line options enabled by O1. So we could, we could turn on each flag individually as given by this fractional factorial design and then run it 2048 times, put it through the previous methodology and we'd get out a set of flags and their relative importance to each other. And one final thing to note is all of these results are we've been taken hardware measurements for. So we've got a rig of all of these different um, platforms, we've hooked them up to a measurement board we designed 
and this allows us to take the total energy consumed by this benchmark. We instrument the benchmark with a start test, an end test, and then we can measure the time and the average power, and then this will give us an energy figure for that unit of work. So, on to some results. So, in general, as expected, energy consumption goes down if you decrease your ex execution time. Um, this is pretty much what most people think, but there are, it is a generalization. It's not true in all cases. There are specific cases where you can turn on some more optimizations and you'll get your energy consum consumption go down a lot more than your execution time and vice versa. There's also the difficulty in predicting which optimizations are going to combine well together. If you combine two of them, is they won't and if you combine two of them and they both have individually positive effects, when you combine them both, they won't necessarily have a positive effect. They may have a negative effect, and that's fairly unexpected. And there's no single optimization which is good across all benchmarks and platforms. You quite often see a set of optimizations which are particularly good for a single benchmark, and in one case we see a set of optimizations which are good for a particular platform, but there's nothing which works in all cases. So now, now before I go into the fractional factorial des design results, we took the measurements at the basic optimization levels. So here O4 is including link time optimization. You can see on the left here we've got the cortex M0 with a finite discrete cosine transform benchmark and on the right we've got the cortex A8. So this is showing the percent, the fractional change percentage uh, compared to O0. So you can see it goes down to about 60% for M0 after O1 and it keeps decreasing down to 25% of what it was for O3 and 4 for the cortex A8. So I can layer on energy on top of this and for the M0 it is almost exactly in line with the execution time so it's almost perfectly proportional and this is sort of expected as the Cortex M0 is an extremely simple pipeline um, there's no real gating in it it's going to be the same power for each instruction so reduce the number of instructions, you reduce your total energy. On the other hand, the Cortex A8 is a bit different. There's a lot of gating, there's, a, there's two pipelines in it. And the difference in energy and time comes from the time decreases a lot more when you enable your superscalar execution, but your energy doesn't decrease as much because you're activating two pipelines and both of the instructions are going down there, taking more more energy but less time. And finally we can add on the average power on top of this which as you would expect as you use both pipelines on the Cortex A8 goes up. So now these were just two platforms, one benchmark. The next graph which is going to be a bit difficult to see has all of the different platforms across the bottom and all of the different benchmarks up the side. So this broadly allows us to see the different trends going on. We can see that for the M0, in almost all the cases, there's no difference between the energy and the execution time. However, as we go to the Cortex M3, there's, it's difficult to see, but there are some slight differences as you approach the O2 and O3 levels. And at the Cortex A8, they sometimes significantly diverge. In the case of the FDCT, it's quite a significant di diverge and in the case of the 2D FIR they diverge as well. So this kind of backs up the point that more complex pipelines will have more complex energy behaviour. With a simple pipeline you can just optimise for speed and it will be as good as optimising for energy but if you're going to optimise for energy consumption with a complex pipeline you need to do something else. One further point to note is that these lines all look roughly similar as you go across the benchmark. So this adds a bit more weight to the argument that the optimization and their effectiveness is dependent on the benchmark structure. We don't see much commonality 
between the platforms at this stage. So now each each point on this graph uh, go back one each point on this graph we ran a fractional factorial design for so each of those consists of 2000 runs and expands into a graph which looks like this so this is taking the point right at the top right at the top here for blowfish 01 on the one of the cortexes and expands it into how each flag affects the energy and the time so you can see for this simple processor they are almost all exactly in line there are some slight differences where you've perhaps got different slight differences in power for example on the cortex m0 it's marginally more expensive to access the memory in terms of energy but it still takes the same number of cycles um, and we also performed the man whitney significance test to check that we're actually getting some significant results which is shown by the bars on top so in this case we see that emitting the frame pointer on the cortex m0 has a a huge beneficial effect whereas there's about 50 percent of the options in the middle which do absolutely nothing So this is another case, this is for the M3, um, again this is taking um, 2000 runs and we see some slight differences now, we see that when we have dash F peephole 2 on it greatly reduces the energy, it might only seem like 3% but this remember this is taken as an average over 2000 different runs. So it's there will be some which are much better than some which are much worse. And there's stuff like schedule instructions which you would expect is better for time than it is for energy as you're not reducing your total amount of work, you're just making it flow through the pipeline better. And then there's some interesting options on the other side of the graph which show sometimes make, making your energy worse while improving your time very slightly. So. I can't explain all of these, but it is definitely interesting to see. And now we come to a case where other factors are coming into play. This is one of the definitely one of the more complex pipelines. So we see that for dash F tree vectorize, we have a significant drop in the energy used by the core, the, by the cortex A8. As I should explain there's three different measurement points for the cortex A8. The MPU, which is the core of the cortex A8, the core, which is the rest of the SOC, and the external DDR memory. Um, as the benchmarks are fairly small, most of this fits into the core sh and should, uh, fits into the MPU and should only affect the MPU. So with dash F tree vectorize, we see that there's a great drop in energy consumption without much change in the execution time. And this comes from the use of the Neon SIMD unit. It hasn't actually managed to vectorize any of the loops, but it has inserted the multiply instructions in the place that they would go. And this uses the Neon multiplier as opposed to the Cortex A8 multiplier, which just so turns out uses much less power than the Cortex A8. So even, even if it's not faster, it's a specialised unit, it, goes, it uses much less power to actually do its computation. Um, and we, ex we verified this separately. So we ran a bunch of multipliers on the Cortex A8 and it was about 30% higher power usage than running in, on the Neon. And that's before taking into account the possibility that you could vectorize the code. The conclusion from this bit, most of the time just optimise for performance and you will get your energy savings. This is especially so for deeply embedded stuff where it's a very simple pipeline. Um, once you start adding in more things like caches, um, vector processing units, it becomes 
a lot more complex and you have to start considering what's actually going to, going to happen. So now a word on predicting the optimizations. So this graph is showing um, just two flags enabled. So we have a set of flags along the bottom, the same set of flags along the top, and we've taken the energy measurement for just these two flags applied on top of um, O0. And we get this funky pattern. We did try to model this, um, but as you can expect, it's not very easy to model. And most of these, these effects come from interactions with, with the optimizations, with other optimizations, and it makes it very, very difficult to actually choose which optimization you should apply next because of this fairly chaotic pattern. And in the end, you can, you can end up making it worse. For example, the, all of the yellow stuff is making it 2 to 5% worse in terms of energy, whereas this few set of blue points is making it up to 8% up to better. This also is a reason why we use the fractional factorial design method, because just turning one flag off, you'll get this weird pattern of effects, which means you can't accurately estimate how much of an effect that individual flag is going to have on average. By averaging it out across thousands of runs, carefully picked, you're going to be able to assign a good effect to the individual optimization. So this is looking at the top three optimizations for each benchmark for each platform. So for example, the Cortex-M3 for 2D FIR, the best optimization in that it reduced the energy by the most is T, which is dash F peephole 2. The second best optimization is G, which is daf, dash F tree TR. And this roughly allows you to see which optimizations occur across each platform and each benchmark. For example, we see with the Cortex M0, M3 and A8, you quite often see similar optimizations appearing in the top three. Whereas for the Epiphany, we often see completely different types of optimizations appearing. And we don't see many commonalities necessarily along the same, platfo same platform. So this again is adding weight to it's your benchmark which affects which optimizations are useful. Your platform has less of an effect, but uh, still some. For example, the Epiphany, there's um, dash F tree dominator ops, which is seen a lot. So, conclusion for this. For simple pipelines, you can just optimize for time. Um, if you, it's a good first step for complex pipelines, but if you want to get that last 20%, you're going to have to do a bit more. You're going to have to enumerate the, op the optimization somehow, or you're going to have to write some specific optimization to optimize for your energy. It's very, very difficult to predict how the optimizations will interact with each other. This is another reason for running many, many tests, if possible. Um, and you see some commonalities across platforms, some common options for um, benchmarks. So what does this mean? We're going to need a better way of selecting our optimizations, uh, which is where this machine level, machine learning optimizations come in. Milepost was a good first start. We've seen genetic algorithms today. Um, a talk later, Majik is going to be is machine guided energy efficient compilation. That's an extension of Milepost, which will allow options to be selected based on their energy efficient uh, energy efficiency. Um, and the guys will talk about that a bit later. Another interesting point to bring up is that all of these optimizations I've been looking at are designed for performance. So 
they've been written purely to make your code go faster without any consider consideration for energy consumption. If you were to write an optimization which specifically targeted energy consumption, what would it do? Would it combine in these ways? Would it give us a greater reduction in energy consumption without much change in time? Um, that remains to be seen. So, for something different. Um, this, was, um, pre this work before was stuff I was doing last summer. This summer I am looking at super optimization in terms of energy. So last year was combining previous optimizations to find interesting energy effects. Today, this, year, this summer, it's finding new optimizations. So the basic idea is that we'll try and create a peephole optimizer which replaces inefficient instruction sequences with energy efficient instruction sequences. And hopefully that will allow us to convert code which has been compiled for performance and then convert it into something which is going to be good for energy efficiency. And maybe I'll come back next year and present how that worked out. Um, I should also say all of this is open, so all of the code, all of the results, the data sets are all online. Um, you can access them and go through them yourself. There's the academic paper which describes this in a lot more detail and a few blog posts talking about various results and I'd love to answer any questions. Yeah. Are the benchmarks also available? Yep. Um, yeah, they're under this link I think, yeah. But the, the benchmarks are um, all derived from my bench and WCET anyway. There's minor modifications to make them work with the framework and in some cases make them work on bare metal systems but they're essentially not not new stuff it's a set which has been brought together from other benchmark sets so a kind of first level question um, you have optimization such as loop unrolling which would typically be oriented more towards a pipeline kind of process yep. processor um, so would that pop up here as being bad for energy consumption just sort of off the bat as a kind of cool. approximation? Quite possibly. Um, do we see loop optimization in... So it doesn't appear in any of the top three, so that would seem to suggest it, that it's not a good, opti not a good optimization in these, for these platforms and these benchmarks. Um, that's, it, that's also independent of whether it had a pipelining or not. Yeah. Is that right? Yes. Across the board. Yes, I think so, yeah. So a different question would be, let's say we take a look at benchmarks, and some are memory hogs. Um, would they tend to be more, would you just you notice those as, if, as consuming more energy? In general, accessing the memory is very, very expensive. So um, to keep things even, um, we didn't use much of the, or any of the external memory for the Cortex-A8. The entire benchmark was small enough to fit in the cache and that got rid of most of the memory effects that you'd see by going out to main memory. Um, but yes, if you, if you have a lot of stuff in main memory and have to transfer it to cache, it's very, very expensive and for energy. Um, I suspect if you were to repeat this with beefier platforms, stuff with bigger caches, you'd start to see stuff like loop and rolling, those kind of optimizations having a much larger effect.